you to turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 25. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, it's our guide, uh, Lord. It's where you reveal yourself to us. Uh, thank you for giving us an environment where we can study your word, where we can learn. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us revelation. We pray for that here tonight, Lord, that we could have revelation and so that we could know you more intimately and walk with you more closely. We love you and we ask you for your help now in Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1. <clears throat> If there is a dispute between men, and they come to court, that the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt, with a certain number of blows. Forty blows he may give him and no more, lest he should exceed this and beat him with many blows above these and your brother be humiliated in your sight. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. What's that all about? Did, I mean, did, 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 you, did it affect you the same way? Why is that thrown in there? Well, that's, that's exactly what I, what I asked the Lord, and, and I did some investigating. But there's some layers here. Let's work through some layers here. Do you remember? I think it was, it was either in the chapter prior in chapter 24, or it was in chapter 23. It was in chapter 24, verse 17. It said, you shall not pervert justice do the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. You shall not pervert justice. We've seen that over and over and over. All through our Proverbs study, we kept coming up uh, against this. Don't pervert, don't twist justice, right? Now... <clears throat> Uh, there were capital crimes uh, deserving capital punishment. And in other words, they kill you. You know, you, you deserve death. And uh, I've, I've, I've thought about this a little bit. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but most of those had to do with either idolatry or immorality. Or, or, or it was retribution. If you killed somebody, you'd be killed for it. But, but just for a, a crime that didn't involve murder, uh, that would be worthy of death. Most of those things were I had to do with a, a idolatry or morality. But this is, uh, and 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 I've I've read some stuff, and most people seem to think that this had to do with these two guys got drunk and got in a fight, right? Not capital punishment, but it was dealt with swiftly. And immediately. You know, when I was in prison in the year 2000, uh, I learned that over 25% of the prison population in the United States of America was DWIs. Isn't that odd? I, I think maybe if we dealt with issues and if we didn't pervert justice, uh, according to the way that God uh, maybe not exactly in this manner, but according to his ways, we dealt with these things immediately, uh, that I think we'd probably have a better outcome. Uh, I, I know that, that I, I don't remember all that much about my former punishments that, uh, that I received for some of my crimes in the past, like when I got locked up or when I got shipped off to a treatment center or shipped off to a mental hospital or I don't remember that much about that but I'll guarantee you if they'd laid me down and gave me 40 stripes with a whip on my back I'll guarantee you that probably would have given me a little inkling to do something different what do you think right okay <clears throat> now 
if we approach this with a legalistic, rule-following mindset like many of the Jewish religious people did, uh, at the, 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 they, they came up with this law said, okay, can't go over 40, so we sure don't want to break God's law. So we're going to reduce that to 39 in case we miscount. <laughs> you know, if I miscount, you know, uh, well, we don't want to break God's law. Uh, can you see that happening? <laughs> now, was that, was that 39? Was that 38? Or that was 30, 38, wasn't it? Wasn't that 38? 37. You see, you see what I'm saying? He says, don't go over that. Don't exceed that. And beat him with many blows above these, or your brother will be humiliated in your sight. And what that means, humiliated works, but it really means that he would be defiled. Because this was a public punishment. I mean, he, he says right there, he, he, if these two guys get in a fight and they come to court, and if justice isn't perverted, in other words, he said, if if uh, they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, uh, then he shall be beaten right there in the presence of the judge, right? So we're going to deal with this now. We're going to deal with it immediately. There is a cap on this because th there, there's something here about this. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. This is a principle that the Apostle Paul referred to over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and he was referring to that the, the minister is, is worth his wages. And he said, did, he says, did, he quoted this verse right here, and he said, was God concerned about oxen only, or does this refer to us? He says it refers to us. And it refers to, and I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that this is a principle that will work in a lot of different places. Because the reason there was a cap on the punishment. Now, we're not supposed to pervert the justice and call good evil or evil good or bitter sweet and sweet bitter. We're supposed to be truthful and honest. And, so, and these crimes need to be dealt with because there is a purpose in it. What's that purpose? Redemption, repentance, actually. Repentance, which leads to redemption, right? So, so this guy is not just getting beaten because, yeah, well, that'll learn you, darn you. No, there's an end game here. E e even, even the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so much talking about the law. The law is what it is. The words say what they say, and the punishment for the crime is there, and that doesn't waver. But the giver of the law loves his creation, even the criminals. Thank God for that. But this punishment has a purpose. If we don't pervert justice, let the guy be beaten, but don't kill him. Don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. There's a purpose in this. Don't interfere with the purpose of the judgment because the judgment is supposed to bring about repentance which puts us in line for redemption. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, it says that they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. With our understanding from the fulfillment of the law. Who are the righteous? Yeah. And, and remember when it said in a chapter or so ago that no father could die in the place of his children and no children could die. And I told you that that was reserved solely for God. God in the person of Christ would be the substitutionary death. that He became sin for us so that we could be justified. We could be the righteousness of God in Christ. You see, this is building something here because this law is leading us to Jesus, right? Is everybody with me? 
Now, now I'm going to stick. I, I, want you to, I want you to hang on to that verse, verse 4. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain because we're going to insert that in every section of this chapter. And I want you to get used to inserting this principle because if we can insert this principle in a lot of different things, then we can begin to not only see the mind of God, but we can see the heart of God at work here. Because everything, if we won't pervert the justice, everything, even things that seem hideous to us, God will cause to work out for good for those who love Him, and it will help us to trust Him more. If we won't interfere with the purpose by muzzling the ox while it's treading out the corn. Does that make sense to everybody? Verse 5. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son... The widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. Verse 6, And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name for his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Verse 8, Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife will... <laughs> I'm sorry... Shall come, to, <laughs> shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal removed forever. Right? <laughs> What's the purpose of this covenant? Or what, what, what is its, what is the, we looked at it, what's the nuts and bolts of this? What's this about? I know the purpose is to lead us to Jesus for redemption, but I'm talking about what's this about? I jotted down the three things here that, that'll be helpful as we go through this chapter. It's to, first of all, it's to preserve the land. We're trying to preserve the land because the land is going to be where the nation is going to be formed that's going to bring about Messiah who's going to be the fulfillment of this law. The second thing is to preserve the family. Preserve the family. God, it was God who established the family in the Garden of Eden. The family's important to Him. It's His family. The nation of Israel is going to bring about Messiah who will bring redemption to the entire world where God can have an even bigger family, right? Okay, and then to preserve the nation, the nation itself. This is about establishing and preserving a nation and its land to separate a people apart from the world around them so that God can bring about redemption in Christ. You see that? Okay, so that's what this is about. So we're trying to preserve the family here. Okay, and in, uh, ma marriage and family is a sacred institution to God. And we're trying to give this some value here. Now, if the guy, uh, you know, uh, uh, marriage is important. And we've talked about making vows in the last couple of studies about and we don't need to make those just mindlessly or carelessly or or I'd have a cavalier attitude about it. I'm just going to go and chase my flesh and get invested in this marriage. And if I don't like this anymore, then I'll just, you know, write her a certificate of divorce and run her off and do something. No. This is supposed to be a sacred institution. Now, I heard this taught, and I have to share it because it's funny. Concerning this. So there's three boys, Jewish boys, in a home. And they're growing up. And one of these teenage boys uh, suddenly begins to stay out till 10, 11 o'clock at night, and he's always gone, and he changes in his attitude and in his behavior. And the other two brothers are like, hey, we know what you're doing. 
what's going on here and who is she because we want to we want to we want to meet her we want to know who she is right because he, he <laughs> because we want to know who you're marrying in case you die <laughs> because I'm going to have to step in here <laughs> right well this guy here he's like mm -mm, no mm -mm, no no not going there see this is supposed to be a family affair a family affair this is supposed to be a sacred institution ordained by God. And if we take it that way going in, which most of us have not, right? What, what, what is, how does, you shall not, what, what's the purpose in this section that we just went through? What's the purpose in it? Because we don't want to muzzle the ox while he's treading out the corn, right? We don't want to interfere with the purpose in this. The original commandment to Adam and Eve was what? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And subdue the earth the land, and care for it because all this is about Jesus. It's about bringing, it's about giving people, giving worth and value to God's ways, which is family. The first thing that the devil has done in our world is start destroying the nuclear family, diminishing the value that we put on marriage. We've redefined marriage. We've redefined, yeah, we're redefining everything because the kingdom of Antichrist is advancing. And how this comes out has a great deal to do with God's people. Where are our hearts going to be? As this continues to unfold, the wheat and the tares are coming up together. They'll be separated at the harvest, and the harvest is getting closer. But we need to be, this is my encouragement to us as the family of God here tonight, we need to be people who are determined to be allegiant to God and His Christ and His ways, which we learn by way of Bible study, okay? So, to be fruitful and multiply. And if any of these hypothetical situations happen this way, well, the way they're going down, it's muzzling the ox while he's treading out the corn. The, Paul was talking about it being a minister. Uh, don't muzzle him because he needs to eat, have his strength while he's doing the work. The minister of justice was the ox in this first section, right? The, the, and he was treading out the corner. We don't want to interfere with the purpose behind the judgment, which is repentance and redemption. In this instance, it's the minister is the will and the ways of God establishing the nuclear family, right? Don't muzzle the ox when he's treading out the corn by becoming <laughs> the guy who got his sandal removed, right? Okay, is that clear as mud? Verse 11, if two, men <laughs> if two men fight together, and Summer, I want you to pay close attention to this. <laughs> if two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him, <laughs> the reason I'm laughing is because that, that's, that's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> if two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him and puts her hand out and seizes him by the genitals, then you shall cut her hand off. 
your eye shall not pity her. <laughs> Don't muzzle the ox <laughs> while he's treading out the grain here, right? <laughs> <laughs> what was the original commandment to Adam and Eve in the garden? <laughs> well, you can't be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> if... <laughs> If if old boy's crazy wife is over here trying to rescue him and seizes him by the right, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the corn. <laughs> verse. Now my eyes are watering. I can't see. Is that thirteen? Yeah, verse thirteen. You shall not have in your bag. Differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall, not, you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 16, for all who do such things... All who behave unrighteously are an abomination to the Lord your God. What are we talking about here? They used scales to measure out flour or grain or gold or silver or whatever. And there were known standards of weight uh, that were used. But, you know, human nature being what it is, there were some guys that might take their knife and whittle a little off Right, or 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 have it have it a little little heavy, you know, or uh, no, it'd be light, wouldn't it? If you had the the counterstone light, then they would get less product. So they might whittle that down a little bit and call it a pound or a pint or a hina or whatever the uh, measurement was. Honesty. Integrity. It, it is in in every kind of recovery program that I have ever been a part of, and that's that's not a that's 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 not a minute amount. The first step in everything, including this program of recovery that I have ever been involved in, the first step of it was honesty and integrity. How can you build trust? By being trustworthy. If, if you want to be able to trust people, then you yourself need to be trustworthy. If you want to be able to see the honesty in people, then you yourself have to, with the measure you use, it'll be done unto you. Whether it's done unto you or not, that's what you'll see out of people. If you're a person who... And I know a little something about this too, who condemns people and mocks and slanders and things like that. Guess what? You're going to be a person who sees that coming, whether it is or not. If you are a person that's given to gossip, you're going to expect that people would be gossiping about you. Because with the measure you use, and it just like in dealing with the public or in dealing with friends and family and community and neighbors when when you're saying hey can I borrow a cup of flour and you're like yeah well let me get the light way down <laughs> that right you see what I'm saying and God said no no I, I, because step one in this program of recovery on the way to the cross for redemption is just like it is in any other program of recovery whether it's from sin or whether it's from booze or whether it's from dope honesty and integrity. Our first responsibility in the kingdom of God is to become 
honest and genuine and sincere people. And we, that, and we, we shake our heads and we say amen, but that is not just something that happens naturally. Because we are not honest people. And we are not hardwired for integrity. It's learned behavior. Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. These things are learned. Honesty is learned. To be people of truth requires us to be people of the book because there's not a media source that's available to us right now that's trustworthy. There's not an institution that we have spent most of our lives just trusting without having a second thought about it that's trustworthy and reliable to us anymore. If we want to be people who are honest and people of integrity, we have to be people of the book. This is the counterweight that we put on the scales to weigh whatever decision it is that we're attempting to make. How does it line up with God's Word? We have to program our thinking to think that way because this is the only reliable source of truth that we have. And the better relationship we have with the Bible, the better relationship we're going to have with the truth. I heard it said on the radio one day this week, and we're almost done, uh, that uh, the relationship that you have with the written word is a direct correlation to the relationship you have with the living word, Jesus. Do you want to be people of Jesus, we have to be people of the book. Because this is where he is revealed. Does everybody agree with that? Remember what, this is verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. 18. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Now, we know that the law is harsh. We know that it is. And we know that sometimes it seems that God is harsh. And sometimes it is. Sometimes He is. But if we will be people of truth and people who trust God, it can help us to avoid some severe consequences down the road. Right? Now, Amalek did not fear God. In other words, the, the weights in his bag, they did differed, and he preferred himself, he feared and respected and revered himself rather than God, and God said, wipe him out, remove the remembrance of him, and if they had done that, a lot of things could have been avoided, but they didn't. There was a king that Israel wanted because he was so impressive to look at externally. He was a tall, handsome guy. Saul. This order was given in the law. Every king was supposed to 
write out his own copy of the law so that he would be familiar with it and know it. But Saul, it's over in uh, 1 Samuel 15, when he moved in, boy, those sheep and cows and King Agag was uh, just a little too much. He, Saul didn't obey the Lord and wipe out the remembrance of Amalek. And it caused all kinds of problems for them. As a matter of fact, David over in 2 Samuel chapter 1 dealt with the last of the Amalekites, the guy that came and lied about Saul's death and all this stuff, and David had him cut to ribbons. But Agag, does that ring a familiar... Have you ever heard of anyone who was an Agagite in the Bible? How about, was his name Nahan? Haman, Haman in the book of Esther. Haman. You remember all the trouble he caused for Mordecai and all the things, but the Lord stepped in and redeemed that situation, and Hanan had to die. He was an Agagite, Agag, the king that Saul disobeyed the Lord and let live, and then he took the spoil that he was supposed to destroy it all. Remember Samuel, the prophet, came up and he said, have you, have you done what the Lord told you to do? And he said, yep, yep, it's all done. And he said, then why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? You're lying. You're no longer king. You're being removed. And David, all that stuff, even though it was hard to understand, even though it might cause us to think thoughts about God that might not be accurate, if we go into whatever the situation is, understanding that whatever it is, God has a purpose in it, and if we won't pervert justice and muzzle the ox while it's treading out the corn, that this thing will turn out in our favor because God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him. Amalek, he did not fear God. And he was a dirty tramp that snuck up behind them when they were tired and weary and killed them from behind. And God said, get rid of him. <laughs> right? And if the nation of Israel had trusted God, It could have turned out a lot different. Now, what's that say to us? Here from a better vantage point, enjoying the peace and the joy that's ours through the provision of the cross in Christ Jesus, surrounded by a culture that screams, it's not right, it's not right, we need to do it our way, this word, this Bible is something of antiquity and it's not relevant to the culture anymore. You don't have to do that. We don't need to be sexually pure. We don't need to worry. We can do this however we want. We're, one, we're the greatest nation in the world. We've turned our backs on God. Sometimes it's hard for a carnal mind. You know, we're all subjected to futility, Paul said in the book of Romans. And it was God who subjected us to futility. But Jesus has redeemed us. And if we will go forth when everything around us is screaming to oppose and maintain our hostility to the Word of God, 
to the Son of God and to the Spirit of God, if we will take a stand and say, no, I trust my God. Because whatever this is that He's bringing about in my life has purpose. And it's for my good. And I'm not going to muzzle this ox while He's treading out the corn. Wherever that fits, I want you to use that. Because we have a God who loves us and He has a destination for us that is unlike anything that we can think or imagine. We have a home secured in heaven and we're going to be in the presence of God Himself and the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed, washed, cleansed, holy, righteous, perfect, and pure if we will simply continue to trust in the Lord. Believe.